Hello and welcome to lecture 10. We're going to be discussing market microstructure and strategies. This comes from chapter 12 in your book. Um, we've seen recently a lot of attention um, given to market micro, microstructure and uh, market microstructure is the process by which securities such as stocks are traded. So it's um, uh, the process and the structure uh, that facilitates trade of things like stock. And we're, so we're going to be talking about some of the details of how this is done and some strategies uh, related to that. So our objectives are to describe the common types of stock transactions, to explain how stock transactions are executed, to describe high frequency trading, and describe the regulation of stock transactions and explain how barriers to international stock transactions have been reduced. So let's jump into the typical stock market transactions. Placing an order. So you want to buy a stock. Um, how do you buy it? How do you place that order? To place an order to buy or sell a specific stock, an investor contacts a brokerage firm, typically. Uh, the investor communicates the order to the broker by specifying one, the name of the stock, two, whether to buy or sell that stock, three, the number of shares to be bought or sold, and four, whether the order is a market or a limit order. So we're going to be discussing a lot of vocabulary, so take notes um, uh, on placing an order. Um, you need the name of the stock, whether you're buying or selling, the number of shares, and whether the order is market or limit order. What does that mean, market or limit order? Um, we'll get into that here in just a second. So a broker, what is a broker? A broker may provide a bid quote if the investor wants to sell a stock or an S quote if the investor wants to buy a stock. So um, again, we want to, the quotes are different. Uh, there's a bid quote and an S quote. So if we are wanting to buy a stock, then we're going to be given an ask quote. And if we're trying to sell it, we're going to be given a bid quote. Um, now, uh, a broker, I was actually a stock broker. I worked for Merrill Lynch. Um, it was my first job out of um, my bachelor's degree. And um, I had clients and they would call me up and say, hey, I'd like to buy XYZ stock. Uh, I'd like to buy this much, this many shares and uh, make it a market order. And we'll talk about that here in just a second. So a market order is ex executed at the best possible price, but it's immediate. So uh, it's whatever the current market price is for it. But they'll, the, the, so the, the brokerage firm will um, be able to execute that order at whatever the current going market price is. Then there are limit orders, and we'll talk about these in greater detail. A limit order places a limit on the price at which a stock can be purchased or sold. So here we're specifying a specific price. Market order, we're just taking whatever the market price is, but a limit order, we are specifying a price. So there's first a stop loss order, and we'll use a stop loss order to protect gains or to limit losses. So investors will specify a selling price that is below the current market price of the stock. So let's say we're trading Apple computer and it's currently trading at $250 a share. Um, we want to limit our losses if, if Apple all of a sudden drops in price. So we could say, well, um, let's put in a stop loss order for $240. So if uh, Apple drops from $250 down to $240, it'll automatically trigger the stop loss order. Um, so when the stock price drops to the specified level, the stop loss order becomes a market order. So once it hits $240 in my example, immediately becomes a market order uh, and the order will be filled as quickly uh, as possible at the current market price. Um, next is what we call a stop buy order. Um, and we'll talk about these a little bit more later on, but uh, this is where investors specify a purchase price that is above the current market price. Um, and so uh, an investor 
might uh, use this in a couple of different scenarios and we'll talk about a specific scenario where this can come in handy. Um, so when the stock price rises to the specified level, the stop buy order becomes a stop market order. So the stop loss is a, a sell order. Um, when it reaches a particular price, when it drops to a particular price, the stop buy is a buy order that will buy when it reaches um, a particular level um, going up when, when the stock price rises. So placing an order. Um, we can do this online and this has become a lot more easy to do and we'll, we'll hop out to a website here in just a second. Um, but many internet brokers accept orders online. They provide real-time quotes and provide access to information about stocks. Uh, some online brokerage services offer zero commission trades. However, investors have to maintain a certain amount of funds in their brokerage account. So a typical trade is going to have a cost associated with that, um, a commission that is paid to the brokerage firm. Um, part of that will go to the broker who's helping you. Um, the other amount will go to uh, support the brokerage firm. Um, if as an investor you have a certain amount of money and you are willing to deposit it into your brokerage account and keep it there, then you can have zero commission. So when I worked for Merrill Lynch, I believe it was $250,000. You had to have $250,000 invested in an account in order for them to waive commissions. So there'd be zero commissions. Um, one of the online brokers that I like to use um, is, let me just see, arrow, um, fidelity.com. So I'm gonna click on this link and we're gonna just take a quick look. I'm gonna do a new share. Okay, so you should be able to see now the homepage for fidelity.com. So you set up a username and account and a password when you get an account and you can log in. Um, and so you can do different things. You can see what, what you currently hold. You can make a trade um, and you can uh, do other types of transactions. Uh, you can get planning and advice. So some financial basics, uh, wealth management, planning for your retirement. You can do research, you can get news, you can um, get quotes. So these are real-time quotes um, for stocks, mutual funds, and other types of investments. Um, you can do research or look at specific types of investment products, such as mutual funds or stocks. Um, so Fidelity, um, they've been a solid company for many, many years. And so my individual personal accounts are at Fidelity, but there are a number of other online brokerage firms that you can use. Let's jump back to our PowerPoint. Okay, so moving onward, um, let's look now at what we call margin trading. Margin trading um, is um, utilizing a little bit of debt in order to be able to buy more stock. And so we'll, we'll go through how this is done. So with margin trading, investors use cash along with funds borrowed from their broker to make the purchase. So let's say we had uh, $500, we wanted to buy $500 worth of stock. Um, well, what we could do is we could borrow funds from the brokerage uh, firm um, and maybe buy uh, twice as much, we could buy $100 worth of stock. So the Federal Reserve imposes initial margin requirements, so the maximum amount that investors could borrow, which represents the minimum proportion of funds that must be covered with cash, currently 50%. So in my example, where we had $500 and we could borrow up to uh, another $500. So that would mean the total purchase would be $1,000 and 50% of that is the amount of cash that we've put in. So that's the minimum initial margin requirement. We can only borrow 50% of what we're trying to buy. So if we're trying to buy 100 shares, we can only borrow enough um, to buy half of that. Um, investors must establish an account called a margin account with their brokerage firm. So 
Um, not all accounts are created equal, and uh, if you wanted to trade on margin, then you would have to set up your account so it was uh, authorized to do so. Over time, the market value of the stock will change. So if I bought $1,000 worth of stock, it could go up, it could go down. Investors are subject to what we call a maintenance margin, um, which is the minimum proportion of equity that an investor must maintain in the account as a proportion of the market value of the stock. So if the stock price drops, we've borrowed $500, to buy a thousand dollars worth of stock. So if the stock price drops and now our total position is worth only $750, we still owe $500 on that, which means our value into it is only $250, which is 25% of the thousand original. So if it dropped below 750, then we would have to come up with some additional money um, there would be a margin call, and we would have to add more money to the account to support that position. Okay, so um, margin has a huge impact on returns. Um, this is leverage. And so uh, if we get positive returns, we will make more uh, than we would if we didn't lever our portfolio with margin. But if, if there are negative returns, it also amplifies the negative returns, uh, which can be harmful. And so uh, here is the formula for how we uh, calculate the return R um, uh, on our investment. Okay, so we've got R, which represent return. SP stands for the selling price of the stock, so the total value of what we sell. So if our $1,000 example, if, it, if the value went up to $1,200, this would be SP. In INV is the initial investment by the investor, not including the borrowed funds. So my initial in investment in my example was $500. So this would be 1200 minus 500 minus the loan, which um, would be the total loan, but it's not an interest-free loan. So it would be loan plus the interest. Um, and then if there were any dividend uh, paid by the stock, that would also be part of my total return. And then I would divide that by my initial investment of $500. So we'll look at now an example of how this um, takes place. And you can see a similar example in your book. So let's consider a stock priced at $40 that pays an annual dividend of $1 per share. An investor purchases the stock on margin paying $20 per share and borrowing the remainder from the brokerage firm at a 10% annual interest. If after one year, the stock is sold at a price of $60 per share, the return on the stock is what? So what is our rate of return? Okay, so let's take a look. So using the formula up here, R equals SP minus INV minus loan plus D divided by INV. So, the selling price is $60. Um, we're going to subtract the amount that we put in, which was $20, and subtract the loan plus interest. So the loan was $20, but we had to pay a 10% interest on $20, so that's $2. So um, the loan plus interest was $22, plus the dividend that we received from owning the stock, divided by 20. So that gives us $19 divided by 20. We made $20 more than, I'm uh, sorry, $19 on top of what we put in. So our rate of return on this trade using margin is 95%. However, without margin, we would have earned just 52.5%. Obviously that's still a huge return, so we wouldn't complain. But um, you can see the difference that margin makes. When we are able to lever our portfolio, um, we can make 95% uh, versus 52.5% in this example. So what happens, though, when it doesn't go up? What happens when it goes down and we have to have a margin call? Well, a large volume of margin lending exposes the stock markets to, to a potential crisis. Okay, so if, if there's too much 
margin out there. If every investor was using margin, meaning that, that a lot of the purchases were done through borrowing um, using margin, um, then it can expose the stock market to a potential crisis. So a high volume of margin calls, let's say the stock market drops and um, for, for a particular stock and everybody's having to um, have a margin call. So a high volume of margin calls results in more stock sales. So people have to sell their position in order to settle it. Um, and so as more and more stocks are being sold, it puts downward pressure on stock prices leading to additional margin calls because anybody who still has margin um, will then have to sell additional shares in order to meet the margin call. And so it can be this vicious cycle that can put, drive prices down and create a potential crisis. Uh, and so margin is um, dangerous um, in scenarios like that. Okay, another type of stock market transaction is what we call short selling. So if we short a stock, and this is where investors place an order to sell a stock that they don't own. So you could short sell um, really any stock um, and you don't own it. The investor borrows the stock from another investor and will return it to the investor from whom they borrowed it. So you don't really own it, you short sell it. Why would you short sell it? Well, you think that the stock price is going to go down. And so you short sell it at today's price um, and you'll return it to the investor from whom you borrowed it, but you'll do it using a lower price in the future. So if the price of the stock declines by the time the short sellers purchase it in the market, the short sellers earn the difference between the price at which they initially sold, short sold the stock and the price they paid to obtain the stock. So short and long, you'll hear those uh, terms in investing. Short selling is you don't own it, but you've sold it at a particular price. Uh, going long the stock is when you actually buy the stock. So in order to settle out a short sell position, um, you have to buy that stock on the open market at whatever the market price is. So if you anticipate the stock to drop, um, you'll short sell it today, you'll buy it later at a higher at a lower price, and you'll make the difference between those two prices. So the risk of a short sell is that the stock price may increase rather than decrease over time, forcing the short seller to pay a higher price for the stock than the price at which it was initially sold. So if you, you guess wrong and the stock is not gonna drop, the stock actually increases, then you'll end up having to buy it um, later at the higher price and you'll lose the difference between what you sold it for and what you had to purchase it for. So a little more on short selling. Uh, we can measure the short position of a stock uh, a couple of different ways here. So there's the ratio of the number of shares that are currently sold short divided by the total number of shares outstanding. So this is a, a, a way to see how investors feel about a particular company stock. If there's a large percentage of short sales compared to the total number of shares outstanding, then that would mean there's some consensus that that stock is likely to drop. Then there's also the short interest ratio. This is the number of shares uh, that are currently sold short divided by the average daily trading volume over a recent period. So now we're looking at not over total number of shares outstanding, but just what is the typical trading volume of that stock if you know 100,000 shares typically trade um, hands in a day, we would take the total um, number of shares that are currently sold short and divide it by that uh, daily trading volume. So how do we protect ourselves if we guess wrong and the stock price increases? Well, we can use a stop buy order to offset short selling. So investors will commonly use a stop buy order to limit their losses. You remember with the stop buy order, we can set a, a purchase price above the current price that it would automatically fill. So let's say we short sell, but we wanna protect ourselves. We'll at the same time put in a stop buy order so that if the stock price goes above a certain amount, we'll end up buying the stock to protect ourselves against losses if the stock continued to rise. 
there are significant amount of concern about short selling. Uh, back in 2008, when the credit crisis intensified, hedge funds and other investors took large short positions on many stocks. And some critics argue that the large short sales placed additional downward pressure on prices and created paranoia in the stock market, uh, which continued to push uh, prices lower. So there are now restrictions on short selling. In October 2008, the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, required that short sellers borrow and deliver the shares to the buyers within three days. So the, no, you couldn't have it last longer than three days. This rule is important because there were many cases in which brokerage firms were allowing speculators to engage in naked shorting, uh, meaning that they didn't have um, uh, somebody else's stock to cover it. So that's uh, in which they sell a stock short without first borrowing the stock. In 2009, the SEC also reinstated the uptick rule, which had been uh, eliminated in 2007. The uptick rule prohibits speculators from taking a short position except after the stock price increases. This rule is intended to prevent short selling in response to a stock's, a stock's continuous downward price momentum. So speculators cannot buy the stock unless it's gone up. Sorry, cannot short sell the stock unless the stock price has gone up. This is this uptick rule. So they can't just see a plummeting stock and then sell it short. They have to uh, purchase it after an uptick. Okay, moving on, how stock transactions are executed. So this picture um, is a picture of floor brokers at the New York Stock Exchange. Floor brokers are situated on the floor of a stock exchange and fulfill and execute orders. Um, there's been actually quite a bit of news about whether or not uh, we need uh, floor brokers anymore um, because of COVID-19, uh, the exchanges had to close the floors. So no longer did we have um, brokers on the floors uh, trading and buying, um, they uh, they couldn't because of uh, COVID-19 uh, concerns and they've been able to work around that a little bit. So there's uh, some talk that floor brokers are going to become extinct in the not too distant future. There are market makers or uh, commonly known as specialists and they can serve a broker function by matching up buy and sell orders on the New York Stock, Stock Exchange, so the market maker. So uh, making a market implies that they stand ready to buy or sell certain stocks, even if no other investors are willing to participate. So somebody comes, they want to sell a stock. If there's a market maker, um, then uh, let's assume there's no other investor that wants to buy that stock, the market maker will uh, purchase it. They stand ready to buy and sell at a market price. Market makers take positions to capitalize on the discrepancy between the prevailing stock price and their own valuation of the stock. So market makers will um, do their own analysis. They'll value the stock. And when they feel like there's a discrepancy between the current stock price and what they feel the true value of the stock is, they'll stand, step in and they'll be willing to um, take advantage of uh, and make a market for uh, those stocks. Um, they may take the opposite position to uninformed noise traders. So the traders uh, who are inexperienced, who uh, um, are making unwise decisions, and there's plenty of them out there in the market, we call those noise traders because they're uninformed. They're purchasing in such a way that um, will eventually harm them. And so market makers, uh, may take uh, the opposite position of noise traders. So how do brokers um, make uh, money on helping to um, transact stocks? Uh, well, in order to understand it, we need to understand what the spread on a stock transaction means. The spread is the difference between the ask price and the bid price and is measured as a percentage of the ask price. So the person selling the stock is selling it at the ask price, this is what they're asking, 
person buying the stock is willing to pay a certain amount and the, um, the difference between the two measured as a percentage of the ask price is what we call the spread. The spread is influenced by the following factors. First, the order costs. So what are the clearing costs and the costs of recording the transaction? Uh, these increase the spread. Um, inventory costs, the cost of maintaining an inventory of stock increases the bid ask spread. Competition, having multiple market makers promotes competition and will reduce the bid ask spread. So order costs and inventory costs will increase the bid ask spread. Competition will decrease it. So you want a lot of market makers. Um, volume, how many shares of stock are traded regularly um, makes a difference. Stocks that are more liquid have a large trading volume and a lower bid ask spread. So these affect the spread uh, on the stock. The last one is risk. If the firm has risky operations, its stock price is more volatile, therefore increasing the bid ask spread. So the less volatile companies will have a lower bid ask spread as opposed to those that are more volatile and more risky. Next, we'll discuss the electronic communications network. ECNs are automated systems for disclosing and executing stock trades. The SEC requires that any quote provided by a market maker be made available to all market participants. So they can't just favor certain buyers or sellers. They have to make that information available to all. So uh, the interaction between direct access brokers and ECNs. A direct access broker is a trading platform on a computer website that allows investors to trade stocks without the use of a broker. Now, the website serves as the broker and interacts with ECNs that can execute the trade. I think the Fidelity website is a good example, although you can call and speak to an actual licensed uh, broker uh, if need be. The advantage of a direct access broker is that investors can monitor the supply and prices of shares and the demand for shares on different ECNs. Okay, so those are direct access brokers. So here's an example of an ECN book um, at a given point in time. So you've got a whole bunch of different types of orders. You've got bids up top and then asks on the bottom. So these are the people willing to buy, these are people willing to share. This uh, first bid, the investor wants to buy 500 shares, they're willing to pay 32.50. Um, and you can see here's another one for 1200 shares, they're willing to pay 32.64. Here, um, this is somebody who's um, asking for or wanting to sell 400 shares, they're willing to sell it at 32.78. You can see the different prices. So bids are typically lower and asks are typically higher. And that, that makes perfect sense. So the difference between that is the spread. A little more on electronic communication networks. There are what are called dark pools. These are platforms that use software to connect buyers and sellers of stocks, but the trades are not immediately disclosed to the public. This allows investors to accumulate large amounts of shares without public knowledge. Um, this, these dark pools also attract high frequency traders. And we'll talk about high frequency traders here in just a bit, but dark pools um, can be useful in uh, many different settings. Um, they're increasing in popularity and they might account for 40% of all trading of stocks based on some estimates. Okay, now let's discuss high frequency trading. High frequency trading represents the use of electronic platforms to execute orders based on algorithms uh, with programmed instructions. So this is pre-programmed um, uh, trades uh, is probably the best way of, of saying it based on algorithms. So um, high frequency trading is run by computers. A human is taken out of the equation so that they can trade very quickly and with high frequency. HFT is also known as automated trading, algorithmic trading, or algo trading. Um, also, uh, you'll hear the term um, 
quant traders. Uh, quant traders usually use algorithms and participate in high frequency trading. So, and this is a really hot area right now. If you're interested in investments um, and uh, you want to work in the investment industry, high frequency trading is uh, very high demand and uh, programmers who can help write algorithms are paid a premium to go work for different investment firms. Program trading represents a computerized response by institutional investors to either buy or sell a large basket of stocks in response to movements in a particular stock index. So um, that is program trading. It's based off of movement in a stock index. Program trading can be combined with trading of stock index futures to create portfolio insurance. Now let's discuss bots and algorithms. High frequency traders use computerized systems for accessing stock market information and interpreting that information. So the, their system is designed to take inputs, information inputs um, uh, that they are able to receive as quickly as possible. And the computer system makes decisions on whether to buy or sell based on the information fed and the bots or algorithms uh, that uh, are used. So traders develop algorithms that attempt to interpret existing information about a particular stock's recent price or volume movements or other information as a signal for its future price movements. So it could be information about that particular stock or it could be other information that is used in the algorithm. The bot is prompted to execute trades as soon as its algorithms recognize specific information that it is seeking. So these are getting more and more sophisticated, um, but they're not perfect. And we'll talk about um, an example of that here in just a second. Um, we experienced in 2010 uh, a what we call a flash crash. On May 6, 2010, stock prices declined abruptly in what is now referred to as the flash crash. It appears that the flash crash was triggered by high frequency trading. Um, and I remember that day very uh, vividly. I was working in my office um, and watching the news as it happened um, and very concerned uh, that we were going to see um, some significant losses. So here is a chart of that day. Um, so we see this is the Dow Jones Industrial Average. And you can see in a very, very short period of time, uh, the stock uh, dropped almost 10%. Uh, it was what we call a flash crash. But you can see what happened very shortly after it dropped or uh, shot back up. Uh, it was still a, a rough day for the market uh, with a close uh, down 3.2%. So, and uh, based on the investigation to this, it looks like high frequency trading was the culprit for this uh, huge drop. Other breakdowns in computerized trading focus on speed to take positions before others investors can cause panic in the markets even when the public information disclosed is false. So sometimes there's bad information that's fed into the system. It makes quick decisions based on the information does a buy or sell, and that can lead um, other investors to buy or sell quickly as well, causing uh, a potential panic. So there's a significant amount of concern about high frequency trading. So various stock markets have attempted to impose new guidelines that temporarily prevent trading when a stock price or market index declines by a particular level over a short interval, such as five minutes. Okay, so um, a little bit more look at high frequency trading. First is high frequency insider trading. This is where some traders with faster trading speed have an advantage over other traders and take advantage of information that they receive before other investors. So there are many information services out there, firms that compile and publish key financial information, and they allow their subscribing um, members or those who pay for a subscription to receive that information uh, seconds or minutes before it's released to the public. 
So these high frequency traders, you can see the advantage of receiving that information um, uh, even just seconds before others. So next is high frequency front running. Other um, advantages are partially due to the multiple stock markets in which a particular stock can trade. So if a stock is trading on multiple stock markets, information speed may be different uh, amongst the different uh, markets. The differences in speed at which the traders can access trading information and submit orders can result in potential gains. So what is the impact of high frequency trading on spreads? Well, it's really interesting to see that high frequency traders have taken market share from market makers because of the large spread quotes by market makers in the past. So high frequency, high frequency traders, their algorithms might recognize um, the chance that the stock is going to go up in, in the next few seconds even. And so they'll immediately make a trade to purchase from one seller and then they'll sell it to a buyer after it goes up uh, a little bit. And so they are they're, uh, basically taking the place of market makers and taking some of that spread. So the, the spreads have, have declined as, as a result of the participation by high frequency traders. Now let's talk into, let's step into a discussion about regulation of stock trading. So there, there's a lot of opportunity for abuse, especially when large dollars are, uh, are in consideration. So um, there have been a few things that have been put in place to help protect investors. First are circuit breakers. These are restrictions on trading when stock prices or a stock index reaches a specified threshold level. So if, if it drops a certain amount in, in a day or within a certain amount of time, then um, there could be a circuit breaker, which would then put a restriction on trading, not allowing any additional trades to happen. Uh, trading halts, this is when stock exchanges may impose trading halts on particular stocks when they believe market participants need more time to receive and absorb material information that could affect the stock's value. So it's just a pause, it's a breather. And this kind of helps to even the playing field for all investors. Uh, those with the advantage, of course, hate this, um, but, um, but looking at the advantage to uh, uh, maybe those who cannot act as quickly, this is a good thing. Trading halts are intended to reduce stock price volatility as the market price is adjusted by market forces in response to news. Also, uh, the tax rate on dividend income from stocks has been increased from 15% to 20% in 2013 for investors in high income tax brackets. Um, and so that uh, affects returns for investors. The SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, um, was formed in 1933 by the Securities Act of 1933 and the Securities Exchange Act of 1934. It gave the SEC authority to monitor exchanges and required listed companies, so those that are traded on those exchanges, to file a registration statement and financial reports with the SEC and the exchanges. And that's not just one time. They have to file quarterly and annual um, reports that are made public. Um, and, uh, and there's severe penalties if the, the statements are incorrect. Um, some SEC regulations involve the following requirements. Firms must publicly disclose all information about themselves that could affect the value of this, their securities. Employees of firms may take positions in their own firm's securities only during periods when they do not know of inside information. So uh, you may or may not remember Martha Stewart. She had some inside information. She told her broker. Her broker gave her recommendation to, uh, I can't remember if it was buy or sell her own stock. Um, and that was insider trading. She went to prison for it. Uh, participants in security markets who facilitate trades must work in a fair and orderly manner. So information has to be given uh, to all market participants, so on and so forth. So the SEC 
uh, tries to protect all investors and make sure that the markets are operating in an orderly manner. So what is the structure of the SEC? Well, the SEC consists of five commissioners appointed by the President of the United States and confirmed by the Senate. Each commissioner serves a five-year term. The terms are staggered so that each year one commissioner's term ends and a new appointee is added. So there's one new appointee added every year by the, the President of the United States. The President also selects one of the five commissioners to chair the, the commission. There are some key divisions in the SEC. There's the Division of Corporate Finance, and they review the registration statements filed when a firm goes public, corporate filings for annual and quarterly reports, and proxy statements. So that's the Division of Corporate Finance. The Division of Market Regulation requires the orderly disclosure of securities trades, and the Division of Enforcement. They assess possible violations of the SEC's regulations and can take action against individuals or firms. And so they have um, their own attorneys, their own judges, and they're able to take action against um, firms if there's a violation. SEC oversight of corporate disclosure. In October 2000, the SEC issued Regulation Fair Disclosure, FD, which requires firms to disclose relevant information broadly to investors at the same time. That means that there's no advantage given to one investor or the other. Um, also, the SEC oversight of insider trading. Insiders of a publicly traded company often have information that would allow them to take favorable positions in a stock before the general public. This type of trading is illegal. Um, the SEC attempts to prevent investors from trading based on inside information. Now, if you look at announcements, such as the announcement of an acquisition, you look at the target of, of that acquisition, so the, the company that's gonna be uh, acquired, um, you can see movement in the stock before the announcement happens. And so you, you can tell that there is some inside information that's leaked out and starting to affect the value of that stock. Uh, and then when it is announced, we see a, a super big jump um, that occurs. Reduction in transaction costs. So we're looking at trading international costs, stocks. Um, in, in past years, it's been very expensive to trade internationally, but we've seen a reduction in recent years. Countries have consolidated their exchanges, increasing efficiency and reducing transaction costs. Many international stock exchanges are now fully computerized. So technology has helped the transaction costs to be reduced. There's also been a reduction in information costs. Information about foreign stocks is now available on the internet. And this enables investors to make more informed decisions without having to purchase information about the stocks. There's also been a reduction in, in exchange rate risk. So a firm may be able to obtain all the financing it needs with one stock offering denominated in euros. The exchange rate risk has to do with um, movements in exchange rate where uh, you value one currency uh, in terms of another currency. Uh, so that is a conclusion of what we're covering in today's lecture on market microstructure and strategies. Um, we in general have a fairly orderly market, um, but uh, it's important to understand the comings and goings, the ins and outs, um, the structure of um, this so we know how best to uh, structure our own transactions, whether we're transacting for ourselves individually or for the corporations we work for or for clients. Um, uh, understanding of the microstructure of the markets is very, very helpful. So I'm going to just show now, I'm not going to read through it. I'm going to show the summary. There are four slides of summary. Pause on each one read through it, makes you understand what it's saying. If you don't, you might want to go back and watch uh, this lecture again or read your book or give me a call on the telephone. There is page two of the summary, page three, and page four. Thank you very much.